Now we're going to go have a look at uh, what energy is and in section 2.1 we're looking at forms of energy and I guess the first thing we need to clear up is what exactly is energy and this is a bit more tricky than it sounds. Uh, let's think of the universe being made of stuff or being made of matter. Energy is what makes the stuff go. In other words, energy is what makes matter uh, go or transform itself. We can define energy as the ability to do work we measure it in amounts called joules, represented by a capital letter J. This is named after a fellow called James Prescott Joule. There are many forms of energy, and we're going to show you some of them in this presentation. I also want to remind you from our previous work that whenever we have forces acting upon an object that are not balanced, then we are going to see an acceleration or a change in motion of that object. One form of energy we have is chemical energy, and some examples of this that are man-made, uh, we see here a cannon going off. Uh, of course, what we're doing here is we're doing a chemical reaction of gunpowder, where we ignite the gunpowder, it combines with oxygen, produces a huge amount of gas, and propels a cannonball forward at great speed. But other chemical reactions, of course, take place in, in nature. So here we see an example of photosynthesis, where light shining on a green leaf causes the green leaf to consume carbon dioxide and water and it produces oxygen and carbohydrates for us to consume. Electricity and magnetism also represent forms of energy and we have a number of experiments that were done earlier by many famous people on this phenomenon. Uh, here's one here called uh, Volta's pile and what Volta did was he took uh, metals of silver and copper and in between them he put uh, paper discs soaked in a salt solution and the salt turned out to be uh, act like a conductor and this was really the, the first primitive battery. This is how they were able to generate electricity uh, way back when. Now, further work was done by a fellow called Michael Faraday, who discovered what's called the, the law of induction, which very simply says that if you take a magnet, as you see here, and you move it in and out of a coil of wire, you will generate a, a current of electricity. And this will only work while the magnet is moving. So if you ever stop, nothing will happen. Uh, Orsted did a rather interesting experiment where he passed a wire that was carrying electrical current over a compass needle and he discovered that it would deflect the compass needle. And so what we found out here is kind of like what Faraday did, that there's a definite connection between electricity and magnetism. Seebeck uh, built a thing called a thermocouple and what this is is uh, two different kinds of metal which when heated uh, cause it to generate an electrical current. We also have nuclear and solar energy. Uh, here's a diagram of what actually takes place inside of our sun. This is a fusion reaction. And fusion simply means uh, putting together. So little guys are being put together into larger guys. So here we see small molecules of deuterium and tritium, and these are just different versions of hydrogen, uh, being combined together to make a larger element, uh, number two on the periodic table, helium. And of course, it releases a tremendous amount of energy. And, and that's what actually takes place inside of our sun. It's, it's literally converting tons of hydrogen into helium through the process of fusion and releasing fantastic amounts of energy. Uh, another type of nuclear reaction is sort of the opposite. Here we take a rather large item. For example, here we have a uranium nucleus, which is a very, very large atom. It gets struck by a neutron, and it shatters into all sorts of uh, fragments. And this is essentially what goes on inside of a uh, a, a nuclear bomb, uh, but it's also what takes place inside of nuclear reactors, except that it's very carefully controlled and releases its energy in little bits. Other types of energy that we need to consider are, are with regards to movement of objects. And so one type here is what's called potential energy. And so here we see a, a kid with a large ball on top of a hill, and we could say that this ball has a lot of potential. It doesn't do much right now, but because it's up high and gravity pulls it down, we could very quickly make it do this, where now it moves. And so this is an example of what we call kinetic energy. And so this is a beautiful example of how we can convert potential energy and turn it into kinetic energy or the energy of a, of a moving object. There's also heat energy that we need to have a, a consideration of. And this one was tricky. One. This one eluded uh, many scientists for a long time. Nobody really knew what heat was or how to define it. 
Uh, some attempts were made. A fellow by the name of Joseph Black, he proposed that heat was some sort of invisible liquid that he called caloric, and it flowed from hot objects to cold objects. So as you can see in the diagram here, we have a hot object in red. It's, uh, it's warm. It, it, uh, it produces a flow of caloric fluid towards a cold object here shown in, in, uh, in blue. But the question remained, where does this heat come from? Well, further research was done by this fellow here. This is uh, Count Rumford. He was actually an American living in Europe at the time, and he was responsible for uh, boring cannons. So here's a picture of how they made cannons back in the day. They literally uh, molded the cannon, and then they bored out the hole with a boring machine. And what he noticed is that you, it seems like he had an almost inexhaustible supply of heat here, and that for so long as you kept up the friction of the boring machine on the cannon, you could keep on producing heat uh, seemingly forever. And so Rumford reasoned that uh, for this reason, it, heat could not be this uh, invisible fluid called caloric, because where is it coming from? Well, it, it can't be a liquid. It, it must be something that's created by the, the motion or the movement of whatever is inside of these objects. This was further refined by a fellow called James Prescott Jewell, and what he did was he built this rather interesting apparatus where he had a series of paddles immersed in a flask of water, and there was a weight which caused these paddles to turn. So as the weight dropped down, these paddles turned, and inside the water he had a thermometer. Now, of course, what he can do right here is, with this weight falling down, he can actually calculate uh, how much work is done by this falling weight using the force times distance equation. But he noticed that that was exactly equal to the change or the rise in the temperature on this thermometer. In other words, he demonstrated that energy can be converted from one form to another form. In this case, mechanical energy can be converted into heat energy. And so now we know that energy is a, is, is, a, is a very interesting phenomenon. It makes the stuff of the universe go, and it can easily be converted. Well, not always easily, but it can be converted from one type of energy into another type of energy, and that's pretty much what this unit is going to be all about.